here's where we're at. Um, the attendance grades should be current. Um, the notes on the Lightboard should be current. I realize I forgot to upload the, the Geotech notes from last week. They're up. Um, and as well as the water notes, they should be up today. Like I said, our review today is going to be primarily fluids um, with a little bit of hydraulics. So that's sort of what I'm covering today. Um, if there's anything that I would cover extra for you, I would think it would be more hydraulics. But one thing to keep in mind about the exam, so for instance, if you're going to be doing any hardy cross, you know, methods on, on the FE, that's really, you know, that's a lot. You know, that's, a, that's an involved problem. And you're not going to do that on the FE, so I wouldn't really worry about that. <laughs> I think I'm covering the broad topics, and I think I have, I have eight problems today. So let me... Um, let me sort of get right into it. Now, I want to say a couple things. The There's a lot in here, but um, in terms of the computations that I'm doing, they're pretty basic. So um, I'm not covering the hydrology, so that's like, you know, flow across the land and, and things like that. Um, what I'm going to cover today is, is a lot of like fluid statics and fluid dynamics. So, you know, pressure and permeabilities and stuff like that. Um, and then we're going to get into some basic hydraulics, like there's some <laughs> main stuff, open channel flow. Um, there's a question on your quiz related to mannings and whatnot. Um, you know, wetted perimeter, stuff like that. So that's sort of the, the gist of what it is that we're doing. So with that, I'm just going to jump right into it. We're going to start with our first problem. So this problem is, it's, Kind of like a manometer problem, not really, but it, it's the, the purpose is to sort of get us thinking about fluids and pressures and unit weights and stuff like that. Sort of shake the rust off type problem. Okay, so I have a 35 centimeter diameter solid sphere. Okay, so 35 centimeters, that's a little over a foot, right? So that means that's a ball about yay big, right? And it's a solid sphere. So it has a density of 4,500 kilograms per cubic meter, and it's suspended by a cable, okay? So basically imagine that I had a ball on the end of this, and I lowered it into the water. But it's not really water, it's, um, there, there's two fluids that it's being lowered into. And so it's been lowered into the, the, this tub such that right here's where it stops, and so uh, above that sphere, there's one fluid, and then below that sphere, there's another fluid. Okay, and so what's the tension on the cable? Okay, now in the end, um, there looks like there's a lot going on here, and there, there's a, a good bit of parameters, but really uh, this all boils down to a pretty fundamental understanding of how fluid properties work. So <clears throat> think about it like this. I have a bowling ball in my hand, right? I, and I, I used this example last week, but if I have a bowling ball in my hand, it has a certain weight. Let's say it weighs 16 pounds, your heaviest bowling ball. Then I jump into a swimming pool. Inside the swimming pool, the bowling ball weighs less, or it feels like it weighs less. Why? Like, what, what's the difference in weight? The buoyancy force. And what is that buoyancy force? Let's, I mean, let's just keep it basic. I mean, not, don't try and think about formulas. It's the water, right? I, the bowling ball is displacing a volume of water that's equal to the volume of the ball. And so the weight of that ball under the water is going to be the weight of the ball out of the water minus that weight of that water. Make sense? Okay, so the only we have basically the same thing. We just got to, you know, recognize that we have two different fluids here. So... If you think about it, this is actually a pretty doable problem. Okay. So, there we go. How many problems are we doing for this? There's going to be eight, and two of them are conceptual, so not too bad. So, first off, uh, the first thing I want to look at is the ball itself. So, it is a diameter of 35 centimeters which is a diameter of how many meters? Yep, there we go. So that means that the radius 
is the diameter over 2, which is 0 0.175 meters, which means that the volume is, is what? How do, how do you determine the volume of a ball, of the sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed, exactly right. So we have four thirds pi r cubed, so four thirds times pi times 0 0.175 meters cubed, and that equals what? Half of that is 
is this fluid, half that is this fluid. So half the volume times the unit weight of this fluid plus half the volume times the unit weight of this fluid. Does that make sense? All right. So we'll call that the weight of the fluid. So here's how we'll do this. The weight of the fluid is going to equal half of the volume times the unit weight of fluid 1 plus half the volume times the unit weight of fluid 2. Make sense? And so that unit weight is going to be V over 2 gravity. Well, actually, here, let's, let's rewrite it because that's going to get a little, a little messy. Rho 1 G plus V over 2 Rho 2 G. And I'm pretty lazy, so I'm going to start factoring some stuff out. So that's VG over 2, rho 1 plus rho 2. Would that be a fair way of looking at it? Okay. <coughs> so now we can start plugging and chugging. So we have 0 0.0224 cubic meters over 2. 9.81 meters per second squared. And then what are our two densities? 1200 plus 1500. And so that equals what? 297. Do I have a second on that? So therefore, what's the tension in the cable? It's the weight of the sphere minus the weight of the fluid. And so that's going to equal what? A second on that? Close enough. And so that's going to be C. All right. Does anybody have any questions on that? I know that one was, like, did that shake the rest off? I, I hope it did. I hope that one did shake the rust off a good bit. There's a lot going on with that one, right? Okay. All right. Now, Dr. Wake would be proud of this question. A floating object is stable when? Oh. I'm gonna get I'm gonna give you all a second with this one. So a floating object is stable when the center of gravity is above the center of buoyancy, the center of buoyancy is above the center of gravity, the center of buoyancy is at the center of gravity, or the center of gravity is above the metacenter. See, I feel like I need to be Regis, you know, and sitting at the desk, and then, you know, we, we ask, <laughs> and then there's that music. <laughs> Do you think Dr. Wade will answer that? <laughs> Alright, hold on, hold on. What I'm going to do for this problem is instead of like, you know, what's the answer, I'm going to poll you. How many people think that it's A? Okay. How many people think that it's B? How many people think that it's C? How many people think that it's D? Good! <laughs> Good! The answer is B. That's what, that's what stability of floating object, that's, that's how you define it. When the, the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy, then you have a stable floating object. So that is correct. The answer is B. Oh, my goodness. You're all 
of what's <laughs> All right. Okay. Six by six by six box with a cube. Six by six by six box. It is a vented cubicle tank, which basically just means it's a box that's open on top. And it's half filled with water, and then the space, the remaining space on top is filled with oil that has a different specific gravity. So what's the total force on one side of the tank? Okay. So <laughs> what we're talking about, this actually has some pretty significant analogies with um, uh, with what we've done with soils and, and effective stresses. So here's the box. Right? And so half of it has water in it and the other half has oil. Okay? Now the fluid on top, it's lighter, right? Okay? So I propose that if I look at the stress or the pressure diagram on one side, so we're looking at one side of, of the cube, so this is six meters. Now help me out. What is the pressure at the very, very top of the box or the top flip? Zero. There is no pressure there. The, the pressure increases as a function of depth. So we start out with that being zero. Okay? And then what happens is how how does pressure increase or how does pressure as, as a function of depth it increases, right? So the deeper you get, the more pressure you get. So after six meters we're going to have some, or after three meters, I should say, we're going to have some pressure. So right about there, we're going to have some pressure. Now, once I start sinking into the water, is the pressure going to increase more rapidly or less rapidly? More. Because the fluid is heavier, right? The oil is light. The oil is sitting on top of the water because it's lighter. So I propose that the pressure distribution actually sort of takes a sharp turn like that. Does that make sense? So, so that's going to be our pressure distribution here. So what we'll do is we'll call this P1 and we'll call this P2. So those are pressures, right? Okay. Now, does anybody know how to determine those pressures? Let's start with pressure P1. How do we determine pressure P1? Say again? Okay, so... Three times. So, all right, hold on. Let's, let's, so, let's keep it simple. So, would you say the gamma for the oil times three meters? that be a fair statement? Okay. Now, what's the gamma for the oil? Well, let, let's keep this simple. What is gamma for H2O? Well, we can do, yeah, we can do, uh, do uh, so 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter, right? Okay. Now, what's the gamma for the oil going to be? How are we going to do that? So 0 0.8 gamma H2O. And what does that come out to be? 7 point, I don't know, like 848. Something when you get start writing on the top of the screen, it starts getting a little jacked. Everybody okay with that? So if I take that gamma times 3 meters, what do I get? Say it again. 23.54. So 23.54 what? Kilonewtons per meter squared, which is kilopascals. Yeah, that's one thing. When you start doing the fluid section on the FE, there's some, there's some metric. So. Now, how do we determine P2? Hold 
one. He, there you go. Say it. You have to take P1 and then add gamma water times 3 meters. So P1 plus gamma H2O times 3 meters. And so what does that come out to be? Like I, I figure by now you all have the values you can plug and chug that pretty easily. So. <laughs> Fifty two point ninety seven kilopascals. What do you think? Sound good? Now, that's the pressure diagram, but how do I get the total force on one side of the tank? Multiply by the area, but Let's, let's do that and let's see what happens, okay? Well, you mean, well, multiply by, you mean determine the area of this? I don't, what do you ask again? How do we determine the total force? Like, here's the pressure distribution, how do we determine the total force? By the surface area. By the surface area of? The area of that side to the 6 by 6. So just take, take what and multiply by 36? Well, to add the sum of 297, pressure 2. Pressure 2. Just pressure 2 times 36. Right. Well, if you're willing to find one side, you're looking at the two. All right, all right, all right. Let, let, let's, let's back this up a bit. Let's back this up a bit. Hold on. Back this up a bit. Let's say I have a wall. And that wall has to withstand a water depth of, I don't know, 10 meters. Okay? Now, water, as you said, has a gamma of 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. All right. What's the pressure at the bottom of the wall? That times 10. That times 10. So the pressure distribution is going to go like this. And this pressure is going to be 98.1 kilopascals. Okay? Everybody with me on that? Now. Let's, let's add some numbers to this, okay? So the water, you know, something like that, whatever, okay? Let's say that the wall is, I don't know, eight meters long. What's the total force on the wall? Okay, all right, all right, hold on, hold on, let's, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, let's go back to static land. Everybody, everybody watch up here, watch up here. Now, let's take this triangle and let's collapse it into a single load. Okay, now that's a fancy way of me asking you a simple question. What is the area of that triangle? One half, 98.1 kilopascals times 10 meters. Is that the area of that triangle? Everybody okay with that? What's that number come out to be? Say it again. 490.5. What are the units? Kilonewtons per meter, right? So this water is exerting a force on this wall that's 490 kilonewtons per meter of the wall. Now I'm going to ask you again, how do I determine the total force on the wall? 
There we go. I multiply this by 8, right? Because the wall is 8 foot long. Make sense? So this pressure distribution, I can collapse that into a load, but that's a load per length of the wall. If I multiply by the total length of the wall, that's the total load, right? Now, let's go back. So, so therefore, so what I can say is therefore total force is 490, yeah, 490.5 kilonewtons per meter times 8 meters, right? Now, let's go back to this. This is a problem at hand. So, what I am proposing is this. If we determine the area of this, just like we determined the area of that triangle, that will give me the force per length of this box. I'm going to take that number and multiply it by what? Six, because the box is six meters long. So therefore, the force is the area of the pressure diagram times the length of the box. Now watch what I'm going to do. Watch this. This is one. This is two. This is three. So this is, tell me how to write the area of the first one. P1. There we go. Plus P1 times 3 meters plus P2 minus P1. There you go. Times 3 over 2. And all times. There we go. This next 
one should be a little easier. Alright. Fluid flows at 5 meters per second in a 5 centimeter diameter pipe. The pipe is connected to a 10 diameter uh, diameter section, 10 centimeter diameter section. At what velocity does the fluid flow in the 10 centimeter section? So what do I do? What's that? There is a single equation that I'm thinking about. You're, you, so Q equals A B, right? Continuity, right? Flow in equals flow out, right? It's just the law of conservation of matter. Fluid can't be created or destroyed, right? That's basically what you're saying here. So I propose that I have fluid going into a section and coming out that the flow in has got to be the flow out, right? And so that's the area in times the velocity in equals the area out times the velocity out. And so what are we trying to find? V out. So I propose that all we got to do is solve this. So, what's that going to be? So, on top, pi over 4 di squared, pi over 4 d out squared. And then, what's the velocity in? 5 meters per second, right? So, what happens to the pi over 4? They cancel, so that's 5 centimeters squared over 10 centimeters squared times 5 meters per second. But Dr. Mike, what about the units? Well, I've got 5 centimeters squared over 10 centimeters squared, so the centimeters squared cancel. So all I'm left with is 5 centimeters or 5 meters per second. So what's that come out to be? Say it again. Do I have a second on that? Yep. Boom. What do you think? Sound good? All right. All right, now let's take this one in. Not let the pressure get to us. I know, I'm such a door. Alright, so a liquid with a specific gravity of 0.9 is stored in a pressurized closed storage tank. The tank is cylindrical, has a diameter of 10 meters. The absolute pressure above the liquid is 200 kilopascals. So it's in a tank and there's pressure above the liquid, 200 kilopascals. Um, and then we cut a nozzle at the bottom. Uh, what's the initial velocity of a fluid jet when a 5 centimeter diameter orifice is open at point A? Take the atmospheric pressure to be 101.3 kilopascals. Okay. What's that? Is this Bernoulli's? This is a Bernoulli's expression. This is a Bernoulli's equation problem. And Bernoulli's equation problems are really easy to identify because if you can point out a point A and a point B. So point A, B, you know, the starting point, you know, or at the top of the fluid, and point B being the bottom of the fluid. And it's also pretty easy to identify Bernoulli's problems when you're looking at differences in elevation. Because that's really where you get your pressure from is pressure head. So let's see what we can see. Now, first off, before I do anything, I'm going to go ahead and recognize that gamma is 0 0.9 times the gamma of water. And so that's going to be, um, we'll go ahead and, and do that in 9, or sorry, uh, 8.829 kilonewtons per cubic meter. So 
It's not water, it's a liquid with a specific gravity of 0.9, so we might as well convert that now. <coughs> so let's see if we can remember what's going on with Bernoulli's. So we have pressure at A over gamma plus VA squared over 2G plus the elevation at A equals point pressure at point B over gamma plus VB squared over 2G plus the elevation at point B. Now, <coughs> what I'm doing for this problem is I'm saying that point A is where the orifice is, where the water is shooting out, or the fluid is shooting out. So point B is right there. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do uh, is this. First off, so let's look at point A. Now, uh, if you remember from Bernoulli's expressions, one of the first things that you try and do is try and cancel some terms out, right? So if I look at point A, right off the bat, do you think there's anything that I could cancel? Pressure. I can cancel pressure, right, because that's an open orifice. Now, keep in mind, it's technically not zero, it's the atmospheric pressure, right? It's being open to the atmosphere. So we can take the pressure at A to be zero, that's fine. Um, so if we take the pressure at A to be zero, my question for you is what would the value for P sub B be if we're going to do that? Like we can do that. Exactly. So it's 200 kilopascals minus the effect of the 101.3 atmospheric pressure. So that's like 98.7. So that's fine if you want to eliminate, but um, you just need to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, is there anything else that we could cancel? Velocity. The velocity at point B. That's absolutely true. Okay, this is something we could cancel because the um, we're talking about the water at the top of that tank. And remember, when you have a sufficiently large tank, you're it's so slow you're saying that's easier. Okay, what else could I cancel? Your elevation. The elevation at A, but if I'm going to cancel the elevation at A, what's the elevation at B? Exactly. So you have to take off that half a meter. So what we'll do is we'll cancel this. We'll take that to be zero, but we have to recognize that the elevation at B is 7 meters minus 0 0.5 meters. So that's 6.5 meters. So just make sure that you know you're, you're comparing apples to apples. And so I think we're pretty much done. Like there's really nothing else we can do because there is there is a velocity at A, like there is the water shooting out. There is a pressure at B because this has an internal pressure inside the tank. And there is a change in elevation. So there's really nothing else we can do with the equation. We're really stuck with what we've got now. So we've got BA squared over 2G equals P B over gamma plus C B. But now it's simple because what are we trying to determine? We're trying to determine B A. So therefore, the velocity at A is 2G times the quantity P B over gamma plus C B. And then we got to take the square root of all of that. <coughs> so So we have 2, we have 9.81 meters per second squared. We have the pressure at B, which is 98.7 kilopascals, over 8.829 kilonewtons per meter cubed. And then that's plus 6.5 meters. It's a velocity. So it's
Are, are there any questions on this? The, a Bernoulli's expression problem is almost a guarantee. Uh, it's almost a guarantee. Sound good? Now, this one's easy, if you remember how to do it. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> the hydraulic radius. Does anybody remember the general definition of a hydraulic radius? What's that? A over what? Exactly. You take the area, you divide it by the wetted perimeter, right? That's the that's the definition of a hydraulic radius. So just to make sure everybody remembers, the hydraulic radius is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to take the area of this, the area of this, and then the area of that box and add it up. So what's the area? Well, it's 5 meters times 4 meters plus 2 times a half times 3 meters times 4 meters. And so what's that come out to be? That's 20, that's 12, what's that, 32? Now the wetted perimeter, what is the wetted perimeter? Can anybody eyeball and tell me what it is? It's 15, right? Because those triangles on the end, those are three, four, fives. This is five meters. This is five meters. So three, four, five, that's three times five meters, 15 meters. So this is 32 meters squared over 15 meters. And I'm thinking that's like 2.13. is like what really gets difficult with hydraulic radii is when you have like a circular pipe and then as the water fills up you have like a circular segment and you have to determine that diameter but a lot of times on the FB when you're dealing with open channel flow problems um, what will happen is if you're being, if you're given an open channel flow problem if you have to compute the hydraulic radius usually you're dealing with like a trapezoid or a triangle or a rectangle something that you can handle um, but if it's circular, it's usually like it's something that's half full, or it's all the way full, or they just tell you what the, you know, the RH over D or, you know, all that stuff. So usually you're not having to, it's not turning into a geometry problem, you know, because it's like, this isn't geometry, this is hydraulics. I know you know, understand the geometry, but, you know, there's, there's time sensitivity. So it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. conceptual problem. First off, before we even get into the problem, can somebody tell me what a Reynolds number is? <laughs> but what is it meant to characterize? Your type of flow, right? If you got a really, really tiny number, we call that what type of flow? Laminar. And if we got a really, really big number, we call that. There we go. All right. Okay. All right. So, if I, how does the Reynolds number? Uh, uh, what does it happen uh, if a one fifteenth scale model relate to a dimensionally similar prototype? So, if I have a model and I scale it down one fifteenth, what what happens to the Reynolds number? So they're either equal, the model's 15 times lower, the prototype's 15 times lower, or it's a function of the velocity ratio. Was that your similitude lecture? So who says, hey, 
Ülsesbi. Ülsesi. Ülsesdi. It's it. That's when you scale a model down, you have to like the rule is that the flow has to be characterized in the same fashion. And the way that the flow is characterized is through the Reynolds number. So you have to have the same Reynolds number. It's basically the one rule that your scaled model has to maintain. So that yes, for, for similitude. Uh, you have to have the same Reynolds number. Okay. How often do you get like they happen. They're not, they're not the majority, but they'll happen. I mean, you will get them. Um, I'd say, and don't don't take this to the bank. I, the people recording are like, this is what Dr. Michelson said. This is what he said. That's America right now. The world. You're, you're on ambient mics, by the way. They, they. That was him that said it. Not um, uh, I, I would bet like five to ten percent. That's a good bet. I mean, is that something to, that's always going to be the case? No, but but you also have to look at it like this. Like all the ethics questions are, are like this, you know. So maybe my maybe I'm skewing it a bit, you know. But like I took, I can take my. Uh, uh, practice exam from NCS and just count up the number of conceptual questions and compare that to um, compare that to, to how many are, are there total and it's probably going to be something like that. So I don't know that that's a great answer. But that's the best I got. Okay, last one. This is this is hydraulics land if I've ever seen it. Okay, I have a, a 12 inch diameter concrete sanitary sewer. It has n equals 0 0.013, that's uh, constant with the depth. <coughs> it flows half full on a constructive grade of 0.5%. What's the flow velocity? Okay, so this is an open channel flow problem, right? So does anybody know what type of equation we're going to be looking at for this problem? Manning's equation. There we go. All right, so let's, um, did anybody remember Manning's equation? It, it's okay, I didn't. I didn't. But then again, I have an excuse. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. It starts with one under n. Has an n. Thanks. And I know n is on the bottom. Okay. <laughs> now, let me show you something. Okay, you said one over n. Um, I want to show you something that's kind of important. So let me go to um, the civil section. I'm actually not sure if it's in here. It might be fluids. It might be here. Hold on. Oh, no. Nope. Right here. So I'm in open channel flow. I'm on page 173. And here's Manning's equation. Now, one of the things that's happened here, and it's something I really want to want everybody to pay attention to. So the manual actually sort of did you a solid here. Um, if you read the, the, the expression for Manning's equation, okay, so first off, there's two expressions for Manning's equation. One is Q equals something, so your discharge, your flow rate, and then the other is your velocity, okay? Now, you said 1 over N. Well, that's true if everything's in SI units, okay? They also threw in the conversion factor for if you're dealing with U.S. customary, and so it's not going to be 1 over N, it's going to be 1.486 over N, and that 1.486 will convert all of your units appropriately. Okay, so the, the, what I'm going to do with this particular problem is really sort of like follow this. And I'm, I'm doing this for a reason because during the exam, here's the thing. I promise you during the exam you're going to be doing um, a problem, be it on Manning's or be it on uh, 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 sheer capacity for you know, a reinforced concrete beam, and you're going to forget something with units, okay? And sometimes, and this, this really happens a lot in the civil engineering section, that you see stuff like this. And so I really want to follow it to the letter, even though this equation might not look like what you did in hydraulics, because you said 1 over N, but I want to follow this because the problem is in U.S. units, and I'd like to, to, to carry on with that. So let me copy this over here. Okay, so 
here's the, the expression, and let me go back to the problem. Uh, here, I'll even, I'll screen capture this too, so we can the same thing. It should automatically copy it when you snip it, by the way. Oh, it does? Oh, I will. I should know that. Okay, so here's our problem. And so what we're asking, or what the problem's asking for is the flow velocity. So really what we're after is the velocity expression. Now we're automatically dealing in US units. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this expression as 1.486 over N times the hydraulic radius raised to the two thirds. And then it's S to the one half, but I'll just do that, the square root of S, okay? Um, okay, and so that 1.486 takes care of all of your unit conversions as long as you follow everything else appropriately, okay? So let's see what values we know right off hand. Do we know what N is? Yeah, that's 0 0.013. That's pretty easy that they gave us that. What about S? Do we know what S is? 0 0.005, right? It's 0.5%, so make sure you add the perfect amount of zeros. Okay, now what about the hydraulic radius? Well, the hydraulic radius is the area over the wetted perimeter. And so now we need to take some time to look at that, okay? Now, first off, the area and the wetted perimeter, notice how that's in feet. Okay, and uh, uh, the areas in square feet. So what do I know about this uh, pipe? I have a 12-inch diameter pipe, but what else do I know about it? The flow is half full. Okay, so here's what we've got going on. We've got a pipe, and the fluid is only up to here. And so this is one foot. Okay. <coughs> So the area is pi over 4 d squared, but it's only a half of that. So it's pi over 8 times 1 foot squared, and so that's what? Say it again. Zero. 0.393 square feet, right? And then the wetted perimeter is what? The wetted perimeter is going to be this line. There we go, exactly. Pi D over 2. So pi over 2, 1 foot. And that equals what? One point five seven one feet. So therefore, the hydraulic radius is A over P, which is what? Zero point two five feet. So therefore, our velocity is one point four eight six. 0 0.013 times 0 0.25 feet raised to the two-thirds times the square root of 0 0.005. Say it again. 3.21, not meters per second, feet per second. And again, it tells you right here that that's, you know, that's what's coming out to be. And so, that's our answer. What do you think? Now, I know there's a lot of stuff. 
stuff I skipped, like in hydraulics land, I didn't do three reservoir, I didn't do hardy cross or any of that stuff. But that's well beyond what you would do on the FB exam. And so there's probably stuff that I missed. Like I didn't talk about surface tension or stuff like that. Um, I did actually do a metacentric problem I could have, but um, I figure, you know, we're, we're, you know, with time and whatnot. So let's be clear as to what's going on. I have a quiz uploaded. It's another short one. It's only six questions, um, but it's a, a little bit more rigorous than what we did here. If you can do this, uh, you should be able to do that. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to do an online lecture on computational tools and ethics. Um, I'm debating as to whether or not to do a quiz because there's not a whole lot that I can quiz you on. It's pretty basic. Um, when we come back, we're doing econ, right? Money, money, money. All right. Then we go into transportation surveying. We do structures, steel, and concrete. Then we hit our schedule back up and see how we want to finish everything out. Does that sound good? That's all I got. <laughs>